Good morning, everyone. My name is Lily Beasley, and I'm honoured to be chair of the board of the Medical Research Foundation of Royal Perth Hospital, where we're having a very special lecture. So welcome to everyone in the audience today. Thank you for coming. But also welcome to all of those around the state, because this is being broadcast live, and it's being recorded. So wherever you are in our wonderful state of Western Australia, from Kamanara down to Esperance, Margaret River to Kalgoorlie and beyond, welcome, because you're here to share with us the experience and the know-how and the wisdom, I'm quite sure about that, of our guest speaker today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about him and how lucky we are that he's here. Professor Russell Foster, CP, Commander of the British Empire, and I gather that it was Prince William who actually officiated and at Windsor Castle, and then, yes, got that right, where something else happened recently, I think, <laughs> of a different uh, genre. A fellow of the Royal Society of London, the most auspicious group of scientists one can imagine, starting with Isaac Newton, and you signed the Vellum book, which is continuing to this day. Many congratulations. Terrifying. Terrifying, <laughs> I'm assured. <laughs> um, a zoology graduate, I'm very proud of that because I am too, of course. Um, BSc and PhD from Bristol University in the UK, then worked in Virginia alongside but doing our different work from our own Nobel laureate Barry Marshall, and you, your family became very friendly with the Marshall family there, so that's an extra link to WA, although as I'll say later, you have been a regular visitor and a huge supporter for us here. You came back to Britain to Imperial College, but not for long because Oxford could see what a star and attracted you to the the Professor of Circadian Neuroscience, the Director of the Nuffield Laboratory of Ophthalmology, and the Head of the Sleep and Circadian uh, Neuroscience Group, and I think we're going to hear a lot more about that. You're based also at Brazen's College in Oxford. We see that a lot of all the Lewis films, I have to say, that come on the TV. I haven't spotted you going in out yet, but I keep watching. And um, you've had many awards for your brilliant work I'm sure you'll talk about this a bit more, but how the heck does the brain understand time of day? How do we know to get up in the morning, go to bed at night, what goes wrong when we get jet lag? How do we cope with working shift work? I'm sure all of you here have done that in the past if you're not doing it right now. We have no idea where the cells work in the body that can do that. You hear about ancient sharks with an extra eye on the top of their head, well, we clearly don't have that anymore and the great discovery that Russell made, and it's been used to build on that for so much more, was where the heck are these cells that do that detecting, what's their characteristics, and how can we make the most of the potential that they give us. And that has implications in lots of different areas, and you'll hear about many of the health ones today. But it goes more widely than that. It goes to areas of education. When are we teaching our kids the tricky subjects versus the easier ones, morning or afternoon? Are our kids secretly tuned in to their laptops or, or their iPhones or whatever at one and two in the morning and getting up and driving to school? Or as Russell told us earlier this morning at a breakfast, actually sneaking their mum's sleeping pills so they could imagine they're having a good night's sleep. So a lot of implications both within the medical area, but more widely in the social context. We're absolutely thrilled you're back in WA. You've been a regular visitor since we first held a grant from the Australian Research Council together to look at what gets marsupials up in the morning and active in the evening too. It's been such a productive relationship. You've helped teach our students here. I know this week you've been having lots of workshops with Professor Peter Eastwood and the like to see how we can pull together what we have here, and I understand, is a very vibrant community working in the sleep area to really make an impact and see issues that are particular for us. The breakfast we had this morning, we had reps from Rio Tinto and Woodside there, really interested in their shift work patterns and things like that. Very important for our workforce, for your patients, for your clients. So I hope you can see the relevance. I'm sure you can. And I invite Russell Foster to share his thoughts with you. Welcome to the Royal Perth Hospital, best hospital in Australia. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much, Lynn. It really is always a, a great honor and a privilege to come back to Western Australia. I think of it now as my, my, my second home, and I'm really delighted to come back. I have, a, I have a couple of daughters who are both in the Southern Hemisphere, so every now, even more excuse to come, to come back. Um, so let's just push that in advance. Sorry, team. Um, can we just... That one. Okay. There we go. So before we kick it off, um, if you are interested in this subject, um, there's a bit of background reading. We published these two books fairly recently, one on sleep and one on circadian rhythms. And there's these, these, these short sort of um, uh, very, very, very short introductions, and they're, they're quite cheap. You can get them from Amazon. And it provides you much of the background that I'm going to talk about uh, today. So we're going to talk about shift work, sleep, and your circadian rhythms. And we've got about an hour, not, not two hours, so I'm going to have to um, uh, go, uh, go a little bit faster than I had originally anticipated. But what I thought we'd do today is consider circadian rhythms and provide a bit of an overview and some of the importance of circadian rhythms to the way we might think about health and, and, and health interventions. Talk about the biology of sleep and circadian rhythms, then the importance of light, and then the impact of sleep disruption, and then finish with possible actions. What can we do now to mitigate some of the problems associated with sleep disruption, and particularly for night shift workers? And, and there's lots we can do, as you'll see. So it's not all doom and gloom. So if we kick off with uh, circadian rhythms, this overview, and not to insult your intelligence, but of course we sit... I don't know if we can do anything about those lights. Uh, at the front there? There's a, there's a thing here. Oh, that's oh. going to be quite dark for everybody. We might all go to sleep. We might. <laughs> but, but, but essentially, we, we, of course, we sit on this planet that revolves once every 24 hours. It generates the night and the day. And in response to that, we and all life on the planet has, a, has evolved a, an adaptive response. And that broadly is the development of a, of, a, of a program of sleep of some sort, and then, of course, consciousness. And these two profoundly different states of sleep and consciousness are underpinned by a constantly variable biology. And I thought we would look at some of these various changes. So in each of these graphs here... Good. Yeah. No, no, what you have before. So in each of these graphs here, you see sort of the gray area, which indicates broadly when we sleep, and it's a 24-hour time base. And I'm just going to show you one example to begin with, which is core body temperature. It's relatively high during the day. It drops in anticipation of sleep, gets to a low point in the morning, but anticipating waking up and increased metabolic demands, core body temperature rises and peaks uh, uh, late afternoon, early evening, before it then descends again. And this pattern will continue under constant conditions. So if you or I went to a deep, dark cave, constant light, constant temperature, we'd still see these beautiful rhythms. And incidentally, this drop in core body temperature seems to be quite important in sleep initiation. If you prevent it, it's much more difficult to go to sleep. And again, we can talk about the implications of that. This is an example of just core body temperature, but we can look at essentially a whole range of different rhythms, whether it be blood pressure, or alertness, our growth hormone release, our cortisol, and of course the big one, the big 24-hour biology of sleep. And just while we're showing this, here's growth hormone, which is largely released during the first half of the night when we're asleep. If we don't get sleep, there's no major release of growth hormone. And of course growth hormone is essential for tissue repair and, and tissue maintenance. So sleep has a big effect upon our ability to rebuild our cells and repair them. Let's have a look. Uh, oh, so, so yes, so, so the circadian system adjusts or fine-tunes physiology and behavior to the profound yet predictable demands of this 24-hour light-dark cycle. Everything that we have in terms of our physiology is being adjusted, ranked up or down, to cope with these varying demands. Let's have a look at some of the uh, clinical importance of two of these parameters. One is blood pressure and one is alertness. And you'll notice this big drop in, in blood pressure and a sharp rise. 
which is again illustrated here. So ideally, you know, blood pressure is something like 130 over 70, if you're lucky. Um, and many people, of course, it's very different from that. But the point I want to emphasize is this sharp rise in anticipation of waking up, which is then further increased as we get up and we increase our blood pressure. Now, if we look at the frequency of stroke, and this is a study from Peter Rothwell, we see time of day along this axis and the frequency of having a stroke on this axis. And you see that between 6 a.m. and 12 noon, there's a 50% greater chance of having a stroke than any other time of the day. Um, in fact, overall, the chances of death um, uh, are, are about 50% greater between these two times, um, which means that, uh, congratulations, everybody, I think we've just survived. Um, no, we're just coming in, you know, we haven't survived the most dangerous part of the day, so, so hopefully I'll, I'll make it through this lecture. Um, but this window of change has big implications. So when should we take our stroke medication? So most of us will be taking our stroke medication somewhere around here, which is at the, the peak of, of when you're having a stroke. Ideally, you should be taking it here. Now, there are ways of delivering medications um, uh, uh, without having to sort of get up and take them, but they're not uniformly introduced. And second, of course, is how do we prepare our healthcare services? If we know that there's going to be that peak in, in, in stroke at that time, what can we do to prepare our healthcare services to deal with it? So there's one example of how time of day can impact upon healthcare. A second would be our uh, cognitive performance. Now, this is time of day along here, and here's essentially a drop in cognitive performance. Now, during the day, there might be a dip in the middle of the afternoon. It depends on who you are. It's fairly stable. But, but as we approach um, 10 o'clock at night, there's a very marked drop in cognitive performance. Gets to its low point for 6, 6 a.m. or so. And then in anticipation of waking up, we get this increase in our ability to function. Now, why is this important? Well, this dotted line represents the level of impairment that you have when you're legally drunk. So when you've drunk a few whiskies or a few pints, your drop in cognition is around about minus 15. However, if you're trying to function at four o'clock in the morning, your ability to function is worse than if you were legally drunk. So if you take nothing from this uh, uh, presentation, the fact that if you're driving a car at four to 6 a.m., your ability to drive that car is as impaired, it's worse than if you got into that car and you'd consume sufficient alcohol to make you legally drunk. Um, no great surprise, therefore, that uh, the highest chances of uh, road traffic accidents uh, accounting for um, traffic volume are in those early hours of the morning when people are essentially lacking that, that vigilance and falling asleep. There's also a new area of, of, of sort of circadian biology, which is the timing of drugs and, and a new area called chrono therapeutics. And I thought I'd just sort of illustrate that to you as well. We've known for a long time that toxicity to various drugs will vary hugely across the day. This is a mouse study showing that this particular drug, or this particular toxin, which is a bacterial toxin, was given at different times of day to a bunch of mice. When you delivered the drug uh, or the toxin at this time, 80% of the mice died, whereas at this other time, 20% died. So that's a huge difference in the uh, ability of these mice to respond to this particular toxin. Now, mice, of, mice, of course, are nocturnal. And it's worth bearing in mind that drug, current drug testing is performed on nocturnal rodents and then extrapolated to diurnal species such as ourselves. And I think this represents a real problem because we've been testing our drugs on mice, and of course you've got to do that, but we've been doing it at the wrong time of day. And as you see, there's a massive change in toxicity. And I don't think that drugs have got to, to market because they're dangerous. I think the problem is that we may have missed really powerful drugs because they've been toxic at, at, toxic at, at a particular time of day. And I think there's a strong argument for retesting some of our drugs that are sitting on shelves all over the world, which initially uh, seem to be very toxic and, toxic and therefore are not usable uh, for humans. Okay. This was then extrapolated, and this is an early study, but I thought I'd show an early study just to show how long this sort of ideas have been around. This is um, in uh, children with leukemia. 
and they were given this cocktail of, uh, of, of compounds. And they were either given the compounds in the morning or the evening. And those that had the compounds in the morning had a two and a half fold greater uh, chance of relapse than those in the evening. So again, a big effect of time of day, same dose, same drug, different time of day, very different outcomes. This is a, 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 an early study, and I thought I'd show you a more recent one, um, which is a time of day for brain radiotherapy uh, on the impact of uh, individuals with brain metastasis. And I think these are really uh, important observations. So what we see here are three different groups. They're all basically the same age. The uh, radiotherapy was given either between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m., 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., and then 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. And you see that the morning group are all dead after a little more than six months. Those that had it in the uh, late morning, early afternoon, all dead by 24 months. And those that had it in the afternoon, uh, many or a significant number were still alive uh, uh, after 36 months. So it gives you a sense that, again, time of day for some of these interventions can be extremely important. And in many cases, we're not taking this information into account. Okay, we've talked about some of these changing parameters, and they provide this wonderfully adaptive response to our dynamic world, but also we can use that information to help time the therapeutic interventions. Now I want to move to the most obvious of our 24-hour rhythms, which is sleep. And let's talk about the biology of sleep and circadian rhythms. And I think, again, we need to put sleep into context. This is a study from the United States, and it basically looks at what 25 to 54-year-olds with children are doing across the 24-hour day. So about 37% of our activities are, are, are work-related, and that includes, includes the commute to and from work. Then it's leisure and sport, household activities, eating and drinking, caring for others, other stuff. But look at this, sleep. So across the lifespan, sleep occupies 36% of our 24-hour day. Uh, at this age, uh, it's around about 32%. And this is telling us something really important. Essentially, 30% of our lives are spent asleep. And yet, despite this knowledge, we've marginalized sleep, we've, we've disregarded sleep, and we've ignored it you know, as an important part of our biology. And what I hope to convince you of today is that we can't ignore this 30% of our lives. So rather than burrow in about EEG and all the various ways you can measure brain activity during the sleep-wake states, I thought it would be interesting to discuss what critical processes are occurring uh, within the sleeping brain. And let's consider brain function to begin with and think about the development of memories, emotional processing, and the processing of information. And to illustrate those really, really key processes that are going on in the brain while we sleep, I wanted to show you a bit of data. Kicking off with information processing. So this is a study from Jan Born's group published in Nature in 2004. And what uh, Jan did was uh, devise a, a problem-solving task. And uh, this is the percentage of individuals in a group who solve the particular task. And the first group, we see that they were introduced to the task in the morning, and then they performed the task that afternoon. And you see that about 20% of the group uh, solved the problem task. The second group... Um, were introduced to the task in the morning, and they performed the task the next afternoon, but they were deprived of sleep. And again, about 20% of the group um, could solve the problem. This is the interesting group. These group. This group was introduced in the morning, they performed it the next afternoon, but they were allowed to sleep. And 60 to 70% of those individuals were able to solve the task. And I think it's just, and it was a very significant result. And I think it's a really important point because sleep promotes the ability to come up with novel solutions to complex problems. And in a society where we're all dependent on problem solving, sleep is our greatest ally in that regard. And in fact, we could argue that sleep is perhaps the best cognitive uh, enhancer that we have. I think another area that I think is worth pointing out to you is sleep memory and emotion. 
This is a, a lovely study by uh, uh, the Sickold group. And there are two groups here. Um, there's those that slept normally and those that had one night of sleep deprivation. So they hadn't slept for 36 hours. And what they were asked to do was uh, remember words with a different um, emotional content. So there were positive words, love, joy, happiness, negative words, hate, murder, crime, and then neutral words. And I went back to the paper to find out what a neutral word is, but it's something like cotton. Um, well, I, I, you know, whatever. Um, so let's look at the ability to remember after sleep deprivation with all the words. And you see that those who were sleep deprived for one night, they hadn't had sleep for one night, there was a very significant drop in their ability to remember all the words. But let's now slice that up. So we see there's a tend to re remember fewer neutral words, but it's not significant. Negative words, again, there's a tendency to uh, fail to remember negative words, but again, it wasn't significant. I think the most extraordinary piece of data is this, in that those individuals who were sleep deprived fail to remember uh, sig very significantly those words with a positive content. So if you have a tired brain, then your ability to remember the good stuff is, at, uh, is, is severely impaired, and you tend to have what's called a negative salience, a negative view of the world. Okay, where well, we've talked about memories, emotional processing, and processing of information generally, what other things are going on? And it's a hell of a lot. The removal of waste products, there's some really nice work emerging at the moment on the removal of beta amyloid from the brain, brain during sleep. And those individuals with sleep disruption have higher levels of beta amyloid within their cerebral spinal fluid. Um, now, one wouldn't say that sleep is going to cause dementia, but it certainly uh, it, it could well be uh, a, a contributing factor, or sleep disruption could be a contributing factor. The brain is regulating growth and repair, as we've already touched on, the regulation of growth hormone. It's replacing energy reserves and rebuilding metabolic pathways. The key point, the absolutely key point, is that so much of our ability to function during the day is dependent upon the biology that is going on whilst we sleep. And what's been extraordinary to me is that we've largely ignored uh, this important biology. No great surprise that in view of the time spent and all the important things going on. Sleep, the sleep-wake switch, involves an interaction of all the key brain neurotransmitters. No matter what they are, they're, they're playing a role at some level. And it's not just the different neurotransmitter systems, but it's multiple brain regions. So we see the hindbrain, the hypothalamus, the midbrain, and the cortex are all interacting to generate this sleep-wake switch. So sleep is a global brain event involving essentially all of the key processes within the brain. But we need to time sleep-wake appropriately. We need to control that release of neurotransmitters and that regulation of all those multiple brain structures. And so how do we do that? Well, there are three factors. There's two biological factors. There's the biological clock, circadian timing, the sleep pressure, and we'll talk about these two. And of course, then there's societal pressures, which we've recently imposed upon our biology. So let's look at the sleep-wake timing system. <laughs> Essentially, we have a master biological clock within the brain. It's called the suprachiasmatic nuclei. It consists of around about 50,000 cells, shown here in yellow. And what's, I think, truly awesome is that uh, those individual clock cells can, can tick away within the brain, they work together, and what they do, uh, this SCN is located within the hypothalamus, as I say, 50,000 of those individual neurons, and they work together to provide the timing cues. Now is the appropriate time to be awake, now is the appropriate time to be asleep. But this internal clock is no use unless it's set to the external world, and for that, the clock um, requires input from the eyes, which detects the light-dark cycle, which sets the clock to local time. The, the, the classic mismatch between the internal day and the external world is jet lag. Eventually you get over jet lag because of uh, uh, detection of this light-dark cycle. Okay, so I said that um, the individual uh, cells here can tick away, 
uh, you can take one of these cells out and you can see it showing a 24-hour oscillation. And one of the great success stories in neuroscience has been the understanding of how this clock ticks. And you'll be really glad to know that I'm not going to go through this. But I illustrate it because it's the discovery of how clocks tick um, that was the, uh, the uh, subject of the Nobel Prize Award uh, last year um, for the, the guys that did it in Drosophila, Young, Rosbash, and Hall. What we can do, yeah, and, and what, essentially what you have is an oscillation of clock, uh, uh, clock gene production and degradation. Now, why this is relevant to our discussion is that changes in some of these genes is being linked to particular morning and evening times. So here's a kind of normal sleep pattern. Here you see sleep here. At the weekends, people tend to sleep in a bit longer, get up a bit later. There's delayed sleep that you classically see in evening types or hours where people are going to bed very late, but of course they've still got to get up early for work, but they're massively oversleeping at the weekends. And then there's the morning types, who are really getting up and going to bed uh, 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 at a really much advanced early time of day. In fact, these individuals find work no problem. These individuals find work often a struggle. And as I say, key genes are being associated with morningness and eveningness. So, uh, as somebody once said, um, by their... Um, contribution to our genes, our parents are still telling us what time to get up and go to bed. Um, so here we have this important biological process, but there's another, which has been called the sleep pressure. And this is perhaps the most intuitive part about sleep, which is the longer you've been awake, the greater the need for sleep, the greater the buildup of sleep pressure. And substances like adenosine are the key factors that build up in the brain that tell us increasingly that we're tired. So let's have a look about how the circadian system and the sleep pressure interact. So what we've got on this axis here is increasing sleepiness. And I want to look at the sleep pressure. So from the moment we wake in the morning, sleep pressure builds and builds and builds. But then when we sleep, sleep pressure dissipates. Now, this time of the day, so late afternoon, early evening, um, you're, you, the sleep pressure is incredibly high but we don't fall asleep. And that's because of the action of the circadian clock. So in the morning, there's a wakefulness drive, which is fairly low. It doesn't need to be high because the sleep pressure is low. But as the sleep pressure builds throughout the day, the clock is saying, no, wake up, stay awake. This is not the time for sleep. And in fact, during this, 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 this late afternoon, early evening, we see a huge wakefulness drive from the clock, which is counteracting that sleep pressure drive uh, from the uh, sleep pressure systems. As we approach sleep, the wakefulness drive diminishes and we fall asleep. And during sleep, the wakefulness drive is very low. But as we approach morning and wake up time, the wakefulness drive kicks in. And at this point, we wake up. So you have these two really important biological systems interacting. And it's these systems that get screwed up as a result of jet lag or sleep disruption. If you're chronically tired, of course, the sleep pressure builds up faster than the clock can say, stay awake. And so we have this tendency, for example, to need a nap in the middle of the afternoon. And we can talk about napping during the question time. But of course, in our society, there are other confounders beyond the biology of the sleep-wake cycle. There's societal pressures such as the alarm clock, which are forcing a sleep-wake pattern on very many individuals. And of course, furthermore, we are consuming huge amounts of alcohol, uh, alcohol um, um, caffeine. we we'll get to alcohol later. Um, huge amounts of caffeine. And of course, caffeine are blocking those receptors in the brain, which allow us to respond to sleep pressure. So the reason we feel more alert after a cup of coffee is because we're blocking the receptors that would normally detect the sleep pressure. And so we're masking the effects of sleep pressure uh, with substances like caffeine. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the systems. Let's go back and talk about the biology of, of light and, and how we detect that light and how it's regulating internal time. So this is a, a familiar picture of the eye to many of you, and we can expand that and look at the retina. And these are the visual cells, the rods and the cones, which detect light 
for our, you know, our ability to, to have an image of the world. And the first stage of visual processing is within these inner retinal neurons. And then a decision is made to fire an action potential in these ganglion cells. And that information then goes off uh, into the brain. Now, here's an individual who's normally sighted. They're uh, a student, so they're going to bed late. Um, this is midnight here. And they have a fairly wobbly get up and go to bed sign here. This is an individual who has no eyes. This is a, a, an individual who's anophthalmic. And you see that their clock is ticking, but it's drifting through time. They have no ability to set the internal clock to the external world. And I stress this because, of course, it's the eye that's detecting the light-dark cycle. Some of you may be aware of some uh, extraordinary crap that was published a few years ago uh, suggesting that the back of the knee might be light sensitive. Um, other people are, are proposing that you can squirt uh, uh, light into the, into the ear and that will set your clock. It's all nonsense. Um, it's the eye in mammals, different from other vertebrates, but it's the eye in mammals that's essential for this light detection. And what we did a few years ago was some extraordinary experiments. We worked on mutants, uh, mice mutants, and they had lost their visual cells and yet they could still regulate their their circadian rhythms and their sleep-wake cycles perfectly normally to the light-dark cycle. And we discovered that in fact there's a third receptor system within the eye. It's not the rods, it's not the cones, but a few of these ganglion cells, about one out of every hundred of these ganglion cells is directly light sensitive and it's these cells that are grabbing the light-dark information and sending that off into the brain. So you can be visually blind, no rods and cones, but not be clock blind if those cells are still there. We then show that this is also the case in humans with some uh, extraordinary collaborations with uh, ophthalmologists at uh, Moorfields and, and, and Oxford. This is what some of these cells look like. They have a cell body, and these are the processes, and they form essentially a photosensitive net throughout the arc of the eye. They are extraordinary, beautiful cells. And as I say, they're directly light sensitive. I couldn't resist showing these additional pictures. Uh, this is some recent data from uh, Steve Hughes, um, and uh, these happen to be sheep photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, which I thought some of you might appreciate. They are sensitive to blue light, blue light of around about 480 nanometers, the blue of a, of a very blue sky that you see here. How much light do we need? And this is a rather controversial area. If we look at the uh, environmental light exposure that we get, we see a huge range from 0.01 to 100,000 lux. So moonlight, candlelight, museum display case sunset is about 50 lux. Office lighting is three to 400 lux, so really quite dim. Near a window, you might get 3,000 lux if you're lucky. Shade outdoors, 10,000 lux. And even in England, we can occasionally get to 100,000 lux. I know that that's kind of obvious in, in, in Western Australia, where 100,000 lux is fairly routine. We, we, we run outside and, 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 and are amazed at the amount of light that uh, exists uh, on a sunny day in the UK. The rods are able to detect dim light here, and the cones can detect relatively low amounts of light to give us our color vision. But those photosensitive retinal ganglion cells are relatively insensitive to light. They're in the sort of 1,000 to 3,000 uh, range. Now, it, it's a bit variable, but they need a lot of light to work. So we need, essentially, bright light to set the clock to the external world. And I think it's worth pointing out that most of us are isolated from natural light. Uh, we live in modern caves, so about 3,000 lux at the window, which would be fine, that would be great to set the clock, but if you move inside, it can drop very rapidly to 50 lux. So most of us are in an environment where there's not sufficient internal light to set the clock stably. And indeed, most of us work in offices where 600 lux would be the exception. It's much more like the sort of 400 lux. So we are a light-deprived species, and we need to take this into account. And we'll come on to this uh, towards the end of the presentation. Not enough light can be a problem. Visual blindness, of course, as we said, need not result in circadian blindness. And so I've been very lucky to work with my colleagues in the Oxford Eye Hospital, Susie Downs, to, to discuss what is the impact of ocular disease on human sleep-wake biology. 
And we've discussed uh, and, 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 and now are publishing a whole series of papers on the impact of cataracts, glaucoma, age-related mac macular degeneration, the loss of eyes completely, um, diabetic retinopathy, and retinitis uh, pigmentosa with and without cataracts. And I won't go through all the data with you, but I'd just like to summarize it. So there are two broadly groups of patients. Patients with visual cell loss, so they've lost their rods and cones as a result usually of genetic disease, but they've retained those photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Now what's happening around departments of ophthalmology all over the world is that if you have visual cell loss, your clinician will say, well, I'm sorry, there's nothing more I can do with you. Um, they won't have checked to see if those cells are still there. And ideally the advice should be to encourage individuals, even though they have no conscious vision, still to expose their eyes to sufficient daytime light to regulate their sleep wake time. And that isn't being done. And if you don't have that daily exposure to light, the clock will drift and out of sync, and then you'll be completely uh, disoriented in terms of your circadian biology. There's another group, of course, where there's inner retinal cell loss. The rods and cones are intact, but the ganglion cells, for example, in extreme glaucoma are lost. There's not a huge amount one can do for those individuals. You can provide medications that can try and consolidate sleep, and melatonin has been partially successful in that, but only partially successful. And excitingly, there are new drugs on the horizon, which we're developing in Oxford, which actually provide a biological, pharmacological mimic for light. We can fool the brain into, into thinking it's actually seeing light. And we're now working with veterans for the blind to hopefully introduce those drugs over the coming years. The key point I want to make is that clinical ophthalmology must appreciate that the eye provides us with both our sense of space and our sense of time. And potentially, this could affect very large numbers of individuals. 39 million people are completely blind throughout the world, 285 are severely visually impaired, and 246 million have uh, low vision. And so a knowledge of these cells could hugely influence the, um, the ability of these individuals to regulate their sleep wake timing. Now let's go on to sleep disruption. So what I sort of built up a picture of is complexity. Uh, so you've got the appropriate light dark exposure, you've got the appropriate sleep pressure, you've got all these neurotransmitters, you've got all these brain structures, you've then got social timing and the consumption of caffeine. This complexity makes the sleep-wake systems immensely vulnerable to disruption. And the sorts of disruption that you see, and we've called it sleep and circadian rhythm disruption, or SCARD, are in three critical domains. The first is short-term sleep disruption, the sort of thing that most of us have experienced in our lives, producing a loss of attention, high levels of microsleeps, the failure to process information appropriately, impulsivity, loss of empathy. Impulsivity is really interesting. The, the failure to sort of, you think you can jump that, uh, that red traffic light. The failure to sort of empathize, the, to pick up the social signals in others. And as we've already discussed, this negative focus. Memory impairment, increased mistakes, as we've already touched on, and of course, reduced cognition and creativity. These are all well-described features as a result of short-term sleep disruption. The longer-term effects of sleep disruption, as you see in night shift workers, for example, would be in immune suppression, increased infection and cancer risk, increased cardiovascular disease, risk of diabetes 2, other abnormal metabolic problems, and increased, massively increased stimulant and sedative use. And then the third domain would be uh, mood instability. In, in mental illness, for example, uh, sleep-wake disruption uh, will exacerbate mood instability. It will exacerbate anxiety, paranoia, and hallucinatory experiences. And it will exacerbate the symptoms of bipolar and schizophrenia. So it's a very, very important feature of mental illness. Let's look at some facts and figures. In the USA, 100,000 crashes every year have been associated with um, sleepiness, falling asleep at the wheel, these microsleeps, these uncontrollable falling asleeps. Um, this is a terrifying example of a microsleep, um, which is the 2010 Air India Express uh, plane. Um, the pilot was landing, 
and then just fell asleep. And uh, we know that the pilot uh, had fallen asleep because we could hear the snoring in the cockpit recorder as the plane hit the deck. And this little lad thankfully survived. This is interesting. This is um, stress levels, cortisol levels in cabin crew after repeated exposure to eight hour shifts. And so here we have ground crew and here we have um, three hour shifts. So short haul versus long haul. And we see that levels of cortisol, the stress hormone, are greatly elevated, significantly elevated in long haul um, cabin crew. So cabin crews tend to be more stressed, including the pilots. This, I think, is a really interesting one. This is comparing ground crew versus cabin crew. And it doesn't really matter what these ta tasks are. It's essentially, these are cognitive tasks. And you see a drop in cognition uh, with a years of career. But you see that the um, uh, cabin crew, those doing uh, long haul flights, showed a significantly greater drop in their cognitive abilities compared to the ground crew. And this is the uh, effect of a global cognition score in uh, pilots um, who uh, had worked one to 10 years or greater than 10 years. And you see this very significant drop in cognitive abilities with increased disruption and uh, transmeridian flights. This is a nice illustration of the brain functioning. And here it's the fully rested brain and it's performing mathematical tasks. And we see all these areas of the brain lighting up when it's doing these cognitive tasks. Here's the same person after sleep deprivation. And for those of you who haven't spotted it yet, that's the level of brain activation. So it's a beautiful illustration using fMRI of how the tired brain doesn't function as effectively um, when it's tired. And the problem is that tired brains like this uh, indulge in biology like this. So the alarm clock will wake the tired brain in the morning and the tired brain will then seek out stimulants such as caffeine and nicotine. And the problem with caffeine in particular is that it has a long half-life. So five to nine hours, for example. So cup coffee in the afternoon, you know, if you're fueling the waking day with caffeine, then you're going to delay sleep in the evening. And the tendency by many is then to take sleeping tablets such as the benzos or alcohol. And yes, they will uh, induce a form of sleep, but it's more like sedation. It is not full biological sleep. And indeed, benzos and alcohol have been shown to disrupt some of those important processes going on within the brain whilst we sleep. So you then wake from uh, an alcohol or drug-induced um, sedation. Uh, you're feeling groggy, you need more stimulants, um, and of course, we all know the consequences of nicotine and, uh, 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 and smoking. And so this leads to uh, the need for greater sedatives and greater stimulants. And this cycle of stimulants and sedatives is a feature of much of the developed and the de developing world. We associate this kind of stuff with adults, but what's so terrifying is that it's happening in our young people. Uh, so uh, much of the waking day for many of our teenagers in particular is fueled by caffeinated drinks such as Red Bull um, and uh, caffeinated tablets such as Pro Plus. In fact, I've been into schools where I've actually seen Red Bull on sale. It's unbelievable. Um, and then that's reversed by over-the-counter antihistamines that will cross the blood-brain barrier and will um, actually... Has anybody here had Phenagon? Anybody? I mean, I don't know the effect it, it had on you. I, I, I decided to try it. Um, as you do, uh, and uh, took it on a Friday evening. And boy, it, I was, I'm clearly sensitive to Fenegan because I was wasted um, for, for half of the following day. These, are very, these can be very powerful sedatives. And of course, they're stealing parental alcohol. And a rather sobering story, I uh, was in a school in Liverpool and was chatting to a 13-year-old young lady. And I said, what's your sleep like? And she said, oh, it's fine. I said, this is wonderful. Tell us why, what's your secret? And she said, oh, well, I just take my mother's sleeping tablets. And this is with full knowledge of the mother. So she was sedating herself with her mother's sleeping tablets. And I then said, well, how do you manage the next day? She said, well, it's not great. But after about three Red Bulls, I can get going. Okay. So, so here's a young brain. Uh, it's still developing. And with full knowledge of the parents, is being treated, abused by these stimulants and sedatives. And we simply have... Um, uh, no real education within the broader society to advise why that is not a good idea. 
Appetite is profoundly influenced by um, sleep disruption. Under normal circumstances, the stomach is producing the, the, the hunger hormone ghrelin, which reaches the brain and, and promotes appetite and, and weight gain. Whereas the adipose tissues produce leptin, the satiation hormone reaches the brain and uh, suppresses appetite. And, and normally these, these two are in, in a reasonable balance. And, and incidentally, before anybody asks, that is not me. Um, <laughs> the, problem, the problem with um, sleep uh, disruption is that it hugely swings the seesaw to the release of ghrelin. So tired people release more ghrelin, they are more hungry, and they are predisposed to weight gain. Some beautiful stuff from Ev Van Kouter's lab in the University of Chicago has looked at this interaction between uh, leptin and ghrelin. So tired people, as I say, are hungry and eat more. Now, sleep disruption also has a big effect upon long-term stress hormone release. Short-term stress hormone release, really useful. But what's happening, and particularly in people like shift workers, is that to cope with the shift workers don't adapt their biology to the demands of working at night. They're still on the same daytime biology as the rest of us. So they're having to override this biological drive to go to sleep. And so it's probably done by activating the stress axis. And so sustained activation of the stress axis is associated, of course, with diabetes and metabolic problems. You're throwing glucose into the circulation, but it isn't being used up. Higher blood pressure, um, heart disease and stroke, reduced immunity um, and increased levels of infection and potentially cancer. One of the things we know about cortisol, it's a fantastic way to suppress the immune system. And it's likely that this suppressed immunity is predisposing to these conditions. Stomach ulcers, abnormal digestion, high levels of cortisol associated with anxiety, mood, uh, instability and depression, and indeed the failure to consolidate memory. So sleep disruption via the stress axis can have a big effect upon our biology. Worth pointing out that natural killer cells, one of these really important elements of the immune system, one night without sleep has been shown to lower the activity of these cells by as much as 28%. So it's a very, very marked uh, impact upon sleep disruption on the immune system. This is a very interesting study that was published a few years ago now. Um, and I just thought I'd show it to you because these are mice with tumors. They have a tumor. And some have just been kept on a light-dark cycle, a normal light-dark cycle of 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. And you see that around about 30% of those mice had died um, by uh, uh, six, 16 days. These mice had a stimu simulated jet lag or shift, shift work protocol by advancing and shifting the light dark cycle repeatedly as you would as if you um, were an airline pilot or a night shift worker. And you see that by 15 days, they were all dead. And it's a good example of how circadian rhythm disruption can, can, can impair our own biology and our ability to fight diseases such as cancer. Okay, so this has sort of been a section of doom and gloom. Um, and I think it's really important to stress modern society has to run on a 24-7 basis. We're not going to put that genie back in the bottle. But on the basis of what we know now, what are the possible actions? What are the ways in which we can mitigate some of these particular problems? And indeed, one could argue, what is the duty of care of employers to their employees? So what can we do now? And I'd like to discuss in the last few minutes of this presentation these following factors. Chronotyping individuals, morningness, eveningness, Higher frequency of health checks, correct lighting, technology uh, to help vigilance, appropriate nutrition, and indeed sleep education. So let's talk about chronotyping individuals. You know that there are morning people and there are evening people. And if you look at the population, you see a beautiful bell-shaped curve. And these are the larks, extreme larks, who like to go to bed early and get up extremely early. And these are the owls who go to bed late and get up late. And this morningness versus eveningness is based upon our genetics, age, young people tend to be late, old people tend to be early, but also when you see light, and we can go into that later on. Now, the difference between biological time, when you want to get up, and external requirements when you have to get up, 
It's called social jet lag. So the difference between when you want to get out of bed naturally versus when you're driven out of bed by the alarm clock is called social jet lag. And the greater the social jet lag, we now know, is associated with poor health, such as obesity and diabetes, worse mood, increased sleepiness, fatigue, increased re risk of smoking and alcohol, and heart disease. And it's worth pointing out that for each hour of social jet lag, it is associated with an 11% increase in the likelihood of heart disease. So it's big. So what could we use this information for? Well, I would say it was relatively straightforward. Why not have the morning people doing the morning shift, the day shift people doing the, you know, the intermediate types, and the late types um, uh, uh, doing the, um, the, the, the late night shifts? And of course, an owl, somebody like me, um, working on the morning shift, would suffer far more than a lark. So why don't we match the body clock type of our workforce to the demands we're making upon them? whether they be morning shifts, day shifts, or night shifts. Another really important area where I think we could intervene is higher frequency health checks. It's all about catching problems early, as many of you will appreciate. And we see in our night shift workers high increased levels of cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, diabetes 2, metabolic syndrome, gastrointestinal problems. Why aren't we screening for these early in this vulnerable population? And again, many of you will be familiar with these statistics. The difference between catching a condition such as cancer early versus late, and these are breast, prostate, cervical, and colorectal, almost 100% survival if it's caught early, but dropping dramatically if it's caught late. And we should be screening for these cancers early in our night shift work population. We should also start to think about um, uh, uh, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a very common problem in night shift workers. And the, and, 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 the, and the brilliant teams working here in Perth, UWA, on sleep apnea and the use of CPAP, this, this forced pressure airway, to try and uh, alleviate some of the problems. So we heard yesterday, actually, that uh, about 40% of the population in their 20s can have sleep apnea, mild sleep apnea. And this can be progressively going on into middle and late age. We should be screening for these conditions, uh, particularly in our night shift workers, and advising them on the use of devices like this. So why not introduce high frequency health checks for shift workers and others with severe disruption? The correct lighting. We've sort of discussed the fact that we are essentially a light-deprived species. And I just wanted to show you one bit of data about light in the nursing home, which I think is really fascinating. And this was done by Als van Sommeren, a colleague from the Netherlands. This is hopefully the most depressing image you'll see all day. It's 20 past two in the afternoon, and it's in a nursing home, and these individuals are being exposed to 20 lux. Um, bearing in mind that you need bright light to maintain a, a stable sleep-wake cycle. This is way, way below. So what else did was improve the lighting conditions in this nursing home by going into the day areas and increasing the light to about 2,000 lux using these light banks. And the consequence of that is this before he introduced the lighting schedule. This is the old, two, this is on average the 2,200 lux that they were experiencing. And you see sort of a fairly ragged sleep-wake profile. After introducing the bright light, activity, sleep, activity, sleep became far better consolidated in a large number of individuals. And very critically, in those individuals who were showing mild dementia, he showed a 10% 10 10 increase in cognition with the stabilization of sleep-wake. And it raises, I think, the very important question that the extent to which the cognitive decline you see in the elderly, and particularly in dementia, to what extent is that associated with disrupted sleep-wake patterns? Technology to help vigilance. So this is a paper that was published uh, last year from a, a group. And this shows that um, these are junior doctors uh, showing that 57% of junior doctors had either had a crash or had a near miss on their dri drive home after the night shift. Um, we lost a, a junior doctor from the John Radcliffe Hospital last year because she, she crashed her car on the motorway. So knowing this information, then why the hell don't we um, give our 
night shift workers uh, for their journey home a device that can fit on the dashboard and tell you if you're nodding off and alert you to uh, falling asleep. The high-end German cars now have this built in, um, and, and these, these, these drowsiness detector systems are, are really, uh, an, uh, I think, going to be an important part in service, uh, car safety. But you can buy devices that can clip onto the dash dashboard, and I think these should be, if you have to drive home after the night shift, these should be given. I think there's a genuine duty of care by an employer to provide such devices to their sleep-deprived employees. Appropriate nutrition. Shift workers are more vulnerable to cardiovascular disease, <laughs> obesity, diabetes 2, and all of these sorts of things. So what do we give them uh, for food uh, on the night shift? Well, it's about as bad as you could get for those conditions. Uh, it, is, it is absolutely extraordinary to me that knowing all of this, we still provide this to this particular group. Why haven't we intervened and made healthier options available to these particular night shift workers? And I think this is low-hanging fruit. We can have a big effect upon uh, the health of our night shift work by providing appropriate nutrition. And then finally, sleep education. Um, the sort of advice about the impact of sleep disruption to both employers, uh, employees and their family. What we've developed are sleep and well-being protocols. How are we doing? Ooh. We've done. We've done. Okay. We've done. So I'll just finish then. Um, <laughs> so w which are based upon... Uh, science of sleep, uh, sleep hygiene, and stress management techniques. And we've introduced these into various sectors, but most importantly to teenagers. And those teenagers who were classified as having a, a class, uh, who will be classified as insomniacs, actually um, have a, a much reduced level of insomnia after just the sleep education. So education can play a really important role going forward in um, the ability of, of managing a sleep deprived population. So sleep education is really important. And it's not just for those individuals experiencing it, but it's for their partners, who hopefully will understand the negative changes in their behavior. And it's worth pointing out that for shift work couples with children under 19 years of age, the risk of divorce is increased by six times when one of the spouses worked between midnight and 8 a.m. compared to the daytime hours. And, and we need to pay attention to these factors. Okay. I finished. So what I hope to have given you some sense of is the sort of the biology of circadian rhythms and why we need to take pay attention to them, particularly in timed uh, interventions in therapeutics, radiotherapy, for example. The biology of sleep and circadian rhythms, it's immensely complicated, as is the regulation of the circadian system by light. And these, this complexity makes it very vulnerable to disruption. And we've seen that sleep disruption has impacts across the entire health spectrum. But it's not all doom and gloom. For our night shift workers, there are things that we can do now. And I would finish with, with a plea for employers to take notice of this and start to be aware of the duty of care they have for dealing uh, with the consequences of night shift work. So thank you for your attention. Hi, everyone. Um, I've met some of you. My name is Joss Young. I'm CEO of the Medical Research Foundation. And uh, uh, on behalf of Professor Beasley uh, and myself, uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, whether you're here uh, in the Blue Sun Lecture Theatre or around the state. Uh, we have been uh, absolutely delighted to host Professor Foster today. Um, I certainly didn't get enough sleep last night. I was up early uh, and uh, I'll be going home to bed early tonight. Um, this is the first of what I hope are a number of seminar and lecture series for you over, over coming months and years. But um, on behalf of us all, we'd like to thank Professor Foster for being with us today. Some of you may have to leave, but for those of you that can stay around, I know Professor Foster does have a bit of time for some questions. So. Um, you may need a microphone, there's some around, but perhaps just have a go in the first instance. Anyone with questions? Thanks, Rick. Um, so you've outlined there quite a lot of the good consequences from uh, uh, the wider general sort of sleep disruption, and I guess the best solutions kind of fix that in the sleep work cycle back. What about the thought about things like power napping? Um, yeah, that's a really good point. Napping is um, a double-edged tool. Um, so a short 20-minute nap 
um, early afternoon has been shown to improve performance during the second half of the day. So a short nap, good. Longer than 20 minutes, you tend to go down into deeper sleep. And recovery from that deeper sleep um, can be completely counterproductive. It sort of it, it leaves you groggy. Uh, the problem is with, with napping if it's, if it's long. Because what napping will do is push back that sleep pressure. Which means that when you're trying to sleep at night, you will actually not be as tired as you should be and it's more difficult to fall asleep. The classic situation is with teenagers. They, they go home from school, they then take a two-hour nap. That hugely pushes back the sleep pressure. They can't get to sleep um, at, at the right time of night. Then they, fall, then, then they eventually get to sleep, um, but the alarm clock is getting them out of bed, so they wake up tired, you know, and, and so you can get this inc you know, increased sleepiness, increased duration of napping. Um, so, the bottom line is a short 20 minute nap from time to time probably useful, but longer um, is, is probably counterproductive. Either way, a nap of any sort will probably push back the sleep pressure and delay sleep onset at night, even for a short period. So the idea of this siesta sort of culture is yeah. uh, running into nature, basically. Um, well, I think what's interesting is if you look at the social structures of those societies where you do have a classic siesta, um, I mean, you know, go to Spain. And you know they're eating uh, nine, ten o'clock at evening, and the kids are still running around. I mean, essentially, that that whole um, a dynamic of sleep has been pushed much later in time. And uh, with adverse consequences? No, it's just that it's incompatible with um, the way we've structured our society. One of the great problems in Spain, as I understand it, is that the the German car industry has gone in um, and established car plants, um, and they don't tolerate siestas. And so that late going to bed late and wanting to get up late, which has characterized Spanish culture for so long, is now in juxtaposition with the, the need to get up early to get to the factory. And it really is fascinating. And, and the sleep patterns of the various European countries are remarkably different. I mean, a friend of mine, Till Renneberg, um, who's based in Munich, we decided to compare the sleep habits of the Brits and the Germans, um, which was a lot of fun. Um, now, the chronotype, the morningness and eveningness, the, the curves overlay perfectly, but the social jet lag, the difference between when you have to get out of bed because of the alarm clock and when you want to get out of bed, is huge in Germans compared to Brits. Um, and I remember being interviewed uh, by one of the red tops in, in the UK about what the consequences of, of, of increased social jet lag. And I said, well, you know, increased sort of smoking, increased alcohol consumption, probably the obesity, coronary heart disease. And they said, yes, but what else? And I said, well, it also affects your sense of humor. Um, and so, <laughs> so very, very stupid thing. Um, you, know, you can imagine what the British press did with that. Um, but, but there are very important cultural differences uh, which have developed, um, and, and we don't pay attention to them. But I mean, it goes to the point, though, is how much sleep do you need? And there are all these sort of books being published saying, you must have eight hours. Well, that's not right. Some people can genuinely get by with six, and some people need nine. And the key thing is that you assess how much sleep that you need as an individual. If you need an alarm clock to get you out of bed in the morning, if it takes you a long time to wake up, if you're dependent upon stimulants, um, if you're oversleeping hugely at the weekend, all this is telling you you're not getting enough sleep. And what you need to do is sort of adapt your lifestyle to get the sleep that you need to be a fully functioning individual. Um, there is no one size fits all. And I think there is a tendency in the press to say, you've got to have eight hours. But well, it varies hugely. Thanks again, Russell, for a, a wonderful talk. Thank you. One of the great transitions of most societies is the sedentariness yes. and the lack of yes. physical activity of any kind. Would you mm. like to comment yeah. on Activity yeah, I think that's really important, and um, there's 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 some data suggesting that exercise will help sleep wake um, stabilization, sleep wake timing, and, and and there was a study that came out a few years ago uh, showing that morning exercise was really good at helping to stabilize sleep wake, and then another study came out um, suggesting that actually morning exercise had no no impact at all at stabilizing sleep wake. The subtle difference between the two studies, not the subtle, the big difference between the two studies, is that the first study, people exercised outside and were exposed to bright natural light, when the second study, they were not. So disentangling 
exercise and its feedback on the clockwork, and it certainly does have an effect at some level, um, versus, the, again, the really important role of light in controlling sleep wake timing, I think is really important. In short, I, I think that exercise will contribute to, to stable sleep wake timing by what mechanisms we don't really know. One, one thing that is important, though, is core body temperature. And so if you exercise late at night, um, then core body temperature goes up, of course. Um, and therefore, it's more difficult to get to sleep because, of course, you've got that, you need that drop in core body temperature to help sleep initiation. It's really, really interesting. We, we worked with an individual, uh, a woman with Raynor's syndrome, very cold hands and feet uh, because of the vasoconstriction. And um, she said she had terrible problems getting off to sleep. And so we just thought, well, how do we promote vasodilation? in the extremities so you can move blood from the core to the periphery so you can lose the heat. And we suggested she wore mittens and bed socks, I mean, not very romantic. But interestingly enough, I know it's an N of one, her sleep improved. Um, and I think it illustrates that, that important role of, of sleep loss, or sorry, of temperature loss for sleep initiation. Okay. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, you showed some striking demonstrations of the impact of Sleep on information processing, yes. in particular the valence effect. Yes, that's extraordinary. Yeah. What's the kind of explanation for that? And does it perhaps relate to hemisphere differences in um, information processing? It's a brilliant question. And I think, you know, what's so frustrating, I think, in many areas of sleep and circadian, particularly sleep research, we're still at the stage of phenomenology. I mean, what we're trying to do in our institute is go beyond that and understand what's going on mechanistically. And of course, to do that, you need to draw upon you know, neuroscientists and clinicians uh, uh, and other, other research groups. So I don't know what the answer is to that, uh, but I think uh, what we've got is a very important observation which we need to investigate further. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you. Yeah. Um, and also, any Oh, yeah, great questions. Okay, so the transition. I mean, I think that um, it's important to appreciate that the tired brain is so impaired, it doesn't know how impaired it is. Um, and one of the things during that transition you need to be aware of is that you will start to screw up, but you'll be unaware of your, um, uh, your, your impa impairment. So take extra care that you, you, know, you really are being vigilant. If, if you're doing drugs, you get somebody, or I know everybody else, you get somebody else to check it anyway, but be really careful about those sorts of mistakes that you'll make going from the day shift onto the night shift, driving home afterwards. You're probably okay for the first few nights because you'll have had a reasonable amount of, of sleep, but then you'll start to accumulate that sleep debt. And then, the, it's very interesting, the accident rate after the transition from the day shift to the night shift, it's on the third day afterwards, uh, on the third night afterwards, that you start to get problems. Excuse me. So, so basically, um, just be extra, extra vigilant. The role of melatonin, I think, is, is fascinating. What melatonin is, is not, let's deal with it first of all, is it is not the sleep hormone. As it, is, as it is always called in the press. Essentially what melatonin is, is a biological marker of the dark. The eye regulates the master clock, the master clock then speaks to the pineal and then the pineal releases melatonin at night. Um, and in fact, the duration of dark uh, determines the duration of melatonin uh, release. And that's actually a very interesting biological signal for seasonally breeding mammals. So sheep, for example, the, the increasing uh, night length in the autumn will trigger reproduction. And that's via melatonin. In humans, it probably feeds back on the clock. It probably reinforces the light signal. Um, and so can partially stabilize sleep-wake. So why it's been shown to be um, uh, efficient for jet lag in some people, but not all, uh, is that it probably um, increases the effectiveness of light by providing a dark signal. But it really doesn't work in very many individuals. But also in about 70% of individuals, it can have a slight sleep inductive effect. And people say that you can take melatonin and you can then 
wake, let's say, from melatonin without all the, the, the sluggishness that you feel from um, uh, other sleep-producing drugs. So it's a, a mild modulator of the sleep-wake cycle. Uh, if you mix up light versus melatonin, it, the clock will always defer to the light signal. So um, it's complicated, it's been overhyped, um, and there are drugs which are trying to mimic the melatonin pathway and being sold for a great deal of money. And the, if you look at the original data, the efficacy of those drugs is marginal. As everyone has said, the marvellous, marvellous, brilliant talk. Thank you so much. We live in a very bright part of the world. Yeah. Are we likely to be subject to some differences in the way we react? And I'm thinking about people going up to the Pilbara and working shift work and the like. Might we have to have a special regime for this part of the world? It's possible, and I think we should do the research. But uh, one of the first studies that we set up, it's taken many years, when I first arrived in, in, in Perth, I sort of got off the plane and, and looked up and thought, Christ, you know, that's what it's supposed to look like. I mean, it was an extraordinary light. And what we predicted is that the brighter the light, the more of a morning person you would be. Um, and so what we did was do a survey of students in uh, UWA, we did in Melbourne, we did it in Auckland, we did it all over the world. Um, and of course the amount of environmental light changes hugely in those places. I mean if you go to Groningen in northern Holland, it's like living in a Tupperware box. Um, uh, which is kind of rude coming from a Brit, but anyway. Um, and we expected to see more morningness associated with brighter light. I, lots of morning people here. We didn't see that. We absolutely didn't see that in those students. What we found was it was the evening light exposure which had the biggest effect upon when you're a morning person or an evening person. And that's because light does different things at different times of the day. So if you see light at dusk, it makes you get up later. If you see light at dawn, it makes you get up earlier. And so the university students were missing dawn, um, uh, but staying out, going outside, getting that bright dusk light exposure. And that was delaying the clock. So, so there's a great deal of discussion at the moment within the lighting industry about how much light, you know, should it be blue, should it be 10,000 lux and all the rest of it. But actually what's been missed is the timing. And I think that's really important. If you're a late person, then you can partly compensate by getting morning light exposure, which will advance the clock. So you can, you can do some things about it. And that's what this study um, nicely showed. And it was triggered by uh, coming here. <laughs> you teaching my class for me, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Um, very quickly, again, Professor Foster, thank you so much uh, for spending your precious time with us this morning. We're incredibly grateful. I'm sure everyone's got some takeaways, uh, both personally and professionally. Um, thank you once again, and um, have a great day, everyone, and have a good sleep tonight. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.